Well, dear all, amigas y amigos, muchas gracias por being with us today for the launching of this new issue of the Journal of Roman Studies devoted to Galician mobilities. We have gathered a pretty good audience today. Thank you very much for that. And I will keep my words extremely brief. I am Ignacio Peiro from Instituto Cervantes in London. And as you may know, we strive to spread the word not only about Spanish, about Castellan, but also about Galician and the rest of our languages in Spain. In fact, it wasn't that long ago that we had an event with the legendary publisher Galaxia. We have also supported the Galician Film Festival these years. In an event about Galician mobilities, it goes without saying that London and Britain have been a haven for Galegos for many years, and still there are lots of them around. Thus, it makes perfect sense to launch this, also with some of them uh, with us this evening. I first heard about this issue in a session of the board of the Institute for Modern Languages Research, then chaired by our friend Catherine Davis, and we thought just how nice it would be to join efforts to launch it. I congratulate the guest editors, Gustavo San Roman, Catherine Barber, and Maria Alonso for this issue that brings new life to the brilliant tradition of Galician studies in Britain and Ireland, a field with such brilliant scholars as Kirsty Cooper, John Rutherford, and David Mackenzie, among others. I also warmly thank Professor Charles Burdett, the newly appointed director of the IMLR. Charles, I'm so glad, uh, delighted that you're here today and I look forward to further collaborating with you in the future. Today, I think we're honoring the modern languages part of the name of your institution since we will be talking in three, English, Galego, and Spanish. Before I leave the floor to Professor Bardot, please let me explain how things will develop today. After Professor Bardot's welcome, Gustavo San Roman will tell us about the making of the new issue. He is to be followed by a short introduction by Catherine Barber and Maria Alonso, who will introduce the contributors and then uh, the contributors them, themselves, namely Carmen Pereira Muro, Yolanda Ogando, David Miranda Barreiro and Dani Barreto will each talk about his or her article. Please bear in mind Joaquin, who is in charge of the audio and video, will ask you to un unmute yourselves before you talk. It seems a bit complicated, but I am confident all will run smoothly. And if not, we have patience and sense of humor to bear with any difficulties that may arise. Just a very important note to finish my turn, please feel free to ask any questions you have in the chat, for there will be time for Q&A at the end and Gustavo San Roman uh, will be in, char in charge of, 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 reading, uh, of reading out your questions. That's all from me, I'm very happy that this year we are celebrating the Chacobeo, the Holy Year, in a very proper way with an event like this. And I beg you all to keep an eye on our cultural program because we will have more on the way of St. James after the summer. Gracias, and I'll leave you with Professor Charles Bordet. Thank you very much, uh, Ignacio. This is one of the first public um, engagements of my time as um, uh, uh, director of the IML arm, taking over immediately from Godella uh, Vice Sussex and before uh, that from Catherine Davis, of course. And what I plan to do is, of course, in continuity with everything that they have done uh, in um, the recent past. I'm very pleased to be working in this environment, not least because it is a time in which the value of learning languages and learning about culture through language is more crucial than ever before. Uh, just to say a couple of words about the Journal of Romance Studies, which I am very much um, looking forward to becoming involved in, in an editorial capacity, um, taking uh, on in part uh, Catherine Davis's work and working with um, Joe Ford. The journal is very much a, 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 an academic output that lives and breathes the mission of the IMLR, which takes me slightly more specifically to this evening. If you were to talk about one subject that lies at the very heart of modern languages and modern languages research, then that subject would be mobility. When we say that we are engaged in the study of language and culture and language and, and culture as they come together, we're not talking about static formations, but dynamic processes that structure every aspect of human being in the world, both now 
and at every stage within the past. So when we come to a collection of essays, we find that the intersection of language, culture and society is woven together in particularly fascinating ways in this collection. There are ways in which the interplay of the local and the global, of the migratory with the stationary, of the micro and the macro is very much to the forefront in all of the essays in this collection. But above all, we have a sense of how the lens through which we study culture is part of the process, an essential and crucial part of what we do when we um, study culture and language, which takes us back to the initial point about the IMLR, its mission, the JRS, and the need for serious study of literature, culture through language. And I'll stop there. I think, hello, I think it is now my turn. Um, Joaquin, am I okay? Yes. <laughs> Shall I start? Thank you. All yours. Okay, thank you. Um, my camera? Right. Here we are. Am I visible? Thank you very much. Um, hello. Um, thank you, uh, Ignacio, and uh, thank you, Charles Burdett, and how do you do? Um, uh, and thank you, Catherine Davis, who was uh, involved in this, in organizing it uh, originally uh, a while ago. Um, when we thought we could do this physically, um, but it is very nice to see you all um, virtually. Um, so let me say a few words about the, the idea behind this, this issue. So I begin by saying good evening, buenas tardes and boas tardes. Um, I'd like to, to tell you something about the idea behind this uh, special issue of the Journal of Romance Studies which we are presenting tonight. I shall do it in English, although we shall use also Spanish and Galician as befits our virtual setting, the Instituto Cervantes, and our theme, Galician Mobilities. Each, each contributor will speak in one of these languages as they present their own articles. The origin of this special issue was an international conference on cultural representations of the Galician diaspora. Um, which took place at the Cultural Identity Institute, Cultural Identity Studies Institute of the University of St Andrews in the summer of 2017. An event supported by that institute, as well as by, very generously, the Junta de Galicia, the European Union, uh, the Spanish Ministry of Education, Culture and Sport, and a Spanish tour company based in Edinburgh, Viajar por, Galicia, por Escocia. <laughs> The conference was the brainchild of Maria Alonso Alonso, a postdoc at St Andrews, who came with a Junta de Galicia scholarship after studying at the Universidad de Vigo, um, and was co-organized by Maria herself, who, uh, it must be said, did the lion's share of the work, as well as by Catherine Barber, who had just completed her PhD in St Andrews on Galician women uh, narrators. Um, recently revised and published by Legenda. So we congratulate Catherine on that. Um, and myself, who had the pleasure of supervising both of these young and promising academics. For this special issue, we selected and revised four of the papers and added a new one, as well as an introduction that reviews recent theoretical approaches to the Galician diaspora and places the selected material within that context. Our aim as guest editors was to give a flavor of the range of textual representations of a subject that has been associated with Galician identity for well over a century, 
since the great migrations of the late 19th century um, to the Americas to start with, which involved people like my own ancestors traveling to Uruguay. Generally poor, with little education and engaging in a voyage which was often of no return. To the current, so we go from them, to the current diaspora of young, highly educated women and men who seek better opportunities and take advantage of low cost travel. We wanted to highlight some markers of this development from the time when news traveled in very sporadic letters carried by transatlantic ships, something perhaps most poignantly signified via the envelope with a black edge that contained the somber news of a relative's passing back home and the current times of WhatsApp, Facebook, and Skype communication. This does not, of course, mean that the experience of migration is now less complicated on a personal or on a national Galician level, as we demonstrate in the article selected for this issue, where Morinha, uh, one of the region's most iconic terms, is not a rare occurrence. Ultimately, our special issue confirms that mobility is never a complete departure from a land which, uh, like a fickle lover, both banishes a good number of its people and endlessly reminds them of its allure. So let us start then uh, with Maria and Catherine, who wrote the introduction to the volume. E que falarán, creo eu, en galego. So I pass on. Bueno, buenas tardes. Eh, muchas gracias a, a todas y eh, e a todos por la vuestra presencia en eh, la presentación de este, de este número especial. Y en particular, eh, bueno, la, la introducción que preparamos conjuntamente, Catherine Barber y eh, e Maiseu, eh, que titulamos. Eh, Galicia on the move. Bueno, a nuestra intención con esta introducción eh, fue a, desfacer, eh, a de ofrecer una visión general, eh, ya no solo sobre un número especial que os presentamos, sino también a desfacer un percorrido por la teoría alrededor de los estudios de diáspora y e de movilidad actuales, pero siempre tendiendo un aponte entre bellos y e nuevos paradigmas con fin de reflexionar eh, sobre el papel histórico que tuvo y e que sigue a tener, obviamente, a, a emigración y e a movilidad de, dentro de los estudios culturales galegos. Bien, pues para esto interesa nos eh, explorar cuestiones relacionadas con conceptos como espacio, lugar, fogar, e o xeito no que estos conceptos fueron mudando, fueron cambiando a través de las últimas décadas, eh, mesmo a, eh, en los últimos séculos, eh, gracias al movimiento de personas, ya eh, se ya a otro lado del océano Atlántico, dentro del do, do Estado español, o mesmo desde la Galicia rural a Galicia urbana. Eh, bien, pues para esto decidimos adoptar un punto de vista interdisciplinar para abordar cuestiones do, do más pertinentes, consideramos, como podrían ser las as siguientes. Primero, ¿de qué xeito a inmigración intra e o transnacional condiciona a producción cultural galega? ¿Cal es la evolución de las representaciones, la movilidad de personas vende o hilo cultural para adaptarse al cambio social, económico y e político do, do último século. ¿Cómo se manifiestan estos cambios, más que obvios, en las últimas décadas, do ámbito rural o ámbito urbano, por ejemplo, a través de la literatura e, e o audiovisual? ¿De qué manera la inmigración, ya sea clásica o a nueva diáspora galega, cuestiona o imaginario nacional e o transnacional y e por último, ¿cuáles son las principales características de la reconfiguración de este imaginario propiciadas por los nuevos discursos 
alrededor de la idea de movilidad o emigración. Catherine. Para dar respuesta a todas estas preguntas, votamos man de un amplio espectro teórico a través de lo que nos achegamos al contexto internacional, lo que se forjan estos imaginarios nacionales desde la de, de diáspora. En esta introducción, y mostro general o particular, gracias a teoría postcolonial, el do espacio de teóricos como Massey, Clifford y Gilroy, por ejemplo, para centrarnos en cuestiones más específicas relacionadas con la teoría de la diáspora galega, gracias a los trabajos de Alex Alonso, José Colmeiro o Cristina Moreiras Menor, entre otros. En esta introducción conectamos diferentes achegas teóricas con los artigos que conforman este número especial para hacer un percorrido dos mismos desde una perspectiva general. Desde, desde Shaito conectamos a idea, a de, a idea de la saudade que explora Forcadella en una de sus publicaciones más recientes, con el termo posmoriña, postulado por San Román en no su artículo sobre Tierra sin mapa de Ángel Rama. Achegámonos a los intereses investigadores de Miranda Barreiro sobre la emigración galega a Nueva York a través de los conceptos de transnacionalismo y globalización de Bertobeck o Schiller. Descubrimos una nueva dimensión no metronormativa del colectivo LGBTQ en los espacios rurales con el artículo de Barreto a vez que cuestionamos visiones más clásicas alrededor del imaginario eh, emigrante galego en las obras de Paro Bazán y Villar Ponte, con las propuestas, propuestas de Pereira Muro e Ogando a través del ecofeminismo y la imaginaria cultural. Con todo, los artículos que conforman este número especial abordan representaciones fílmicas, literarias y teatrales, producidas desde el siglo XIX hasta la actualidad, algunas más conocidas que otras, o que serve también para tender pontes entre diferentes elementos. En conjunto, los artículos que conforman este número especial sugieren que existe una relación ambivalente entre bellos y nuevos paradigmas alrededor de los estudios de, de diáspora, sobre todo cuando estos se aplican a la emigración galega como caso de estudio. La producción cultural galega es ilustrativa de esta evolución ya que representa un ejemplo de interseccionalidad y liminalidad no normativa. Algunas de estas manifestaciones culturales que se dan desde la marcha diaspórica suponen, se suponen dos ejemplos de contradiscursos que fan que re reconsideremos aspectos relacionados con el sentido de galeguidad en una época en la que los movimientos migratorios implican una reconfiguración constante del imaginario global. Bien, pues, eh, sin más dilación, pasamos a presentar a las personas que tan amablemente contribuyen a este número especial o a sus investigaciones. E comenzamos con Carmen Pereira Muro, de Texas Tech University, uh, cuyo artículo lleva por título Struggling with the Rosalian Myth, Galician Migration, Gender and Nationalism in Morriña, by Emilia Pardo Bazán. Sí. Bueno, hola, buenas, buenas tardes, días. No sé muy bien en qué uso horario están, están todos los, los asistentes. Eh, bueno, quería empezar dando mil millones de gracias a, a María, a Catherine y a, y a Gustavo por el maravilloso trabajo que hicieron en su día con el Congreso y luego con, con la edición eh, de, este, de este número especial de Journal of Romance Studies. 
Eh, como sé que tenemos un tiempo limitado, voy a tratar de dar un poco, una pequeña sinopsis de, del trabajo que, que, eh, que, eh, con el que contribuyo a este, a este número y que, bueno, parte, por supuesto, de ese congreso, ¿no? Porque eh, por una, el, el, el origen, digamos, de, de mi interés por esta novela de, de Pardo Bazán titulada muy adecuadamente Morriña, Uh, es que es una novela muy poco tratada en general porque formaba parte de, de un díptico con Insolación, que es la novela más conocida, más estudiada, eh, sobre todo porque tiene un maravilloso final feliz de empoderamiento femenino y de apreciación de la satisfacción sexual de la mujer. Dos morriñas se quedaba un poco de lado. El, el congreso de, de St. Andrews me, me alentó ¿no? a, a adentrarme en, en el estudio de, de Morriña eh, y descubrí que es una novela fascinante. Eh, fascinante sobre todo si se pone en, en, en diálogo, ¿no? en, en contexto con lo que Núñez Seixas ha llamado el, el mito rosaliano. ¿no? no es lo que Rosalía en sí está escribiendo en, en su poesía, sino lo que los, los emigrantes, ¿no? la comunidad transnacional eh, que se crea en la diáspora del siglo XIX, construye en base a la poesía de Rosalía, ¿no? a ese dispositivo de nostalgia que les hace desear ¿no? a, esa, a esa mujer tierra eh, que es Galicia. Eh, entonces, bueno, me gustaría poner un poco en, en contexto el, en, de, la, de la producción cultural y el pensamiento de Pardo Bazán eh, esta novela, ¿no? Morriña que publica en 1889 y que es una época en la que Emilia Pardo Bazán, que estoy segura que la mayoría del público conoce, además está muy de moda últimamente, eh, es un momento de, de, de cambios, de transiciones, eh, por un lado del determinismo, del naturalismo que caracteriza su producción anterior, hacia un psicologismo, eh, hacia un feminismo cada vez más militante, más explícito eh, y también, algo que nos interesa especialmente para esta novela, eh, un enfrentamiento cada vez más, más marcado con el regionalismo gallego, ¿no? en especial con, con Manuel Murguía. Eh, y uno de los detonantes de, de este enfrentamiento es el discurso que dio en 1885 sobre la poesía de Rosalía de Castro, eh, titulado La poesía regional gallega, en el que trata de confinar ¿no? la poesía de Rosario de Castro en este ámbito del folclorismo, ¿no? de una Galicia idílica, bucólica, y desecha la producción posterior a cantares gallegos como enfermiza poesía lírica. ¿no? La, la subjetividad no es algo que ese regionalismo folclórico eh, que, ya, que ya quiere tener eh, sea aceptable. ¿no? Entonces, eh, para... Para eh, que se entienda bien por qué eh, es eh, nos, nos habla de un caso un poco manido en la literatura de la época, quizás por eso también no se ha estudiado tanto, que es el de la seducción, posterior abandono y suicidio final de, de una chica de clase humilde, una, una criada gallega, en, en este caso, ¿no? producida por el señorito de la casa, una, una familia de clase media que, gallega que vive en Madrid, donde ella ha ido a servir. Eh, la chica, la, la criada, se llama Esclavitud y es la hija de un ilegítima de un cura. ¿no? Entonces, ya hay una resonancia biográfica con Rosalía, pero aparte de estas... ¿no? similitudes anecdóticas. Eh, los parlamentos de esclavitud en esta novela son una paráfrasis casi de, de las poesías más conocidas de Rosalía de Castro, las que repiten los emigrantes gallegos de la diáspora en sus, en sus cartas. ¿no? Eh, hay niños, hay niños, aires, siendo una de las, de las más utilizadas ¿no? en, en la novela. Nos, nos que explica cómo por Galicia ¿no? que, que desfallece que de ser rosa y blanca como era se está convirtiendo en una moura. Entonces son palabras literales que está, que está utilizando. Eh, ahora, el tratamiento narrativo de, de esclavitud en, en esta novela es muy sintomático, porque a diferencia de eh, novelística, aquí no hay ningún tipo de exploración psicológica del personaje. Solamente lo vemos desde fuera. Es una visión 
eh, externa, objetiva, no tenemos acceso a sus pensamientos en ningún momento, eh, pero vemos cómo a través de la novela Esclavitud se convierte en este objeto de deseo erótico de, de, del hijo, de, de la familia, de Rogelio, y de todos los tertulianos gallegos ¿no? que, acuden, que acuden a la casa y que la, la van asimilando cada vez más ellos y la voz narrativa a esa tierra gallega, a ese paisaje gallego eh, deseado ¿no? eh, por, el que sienten, por el que sienten morriña. Eh, finalmente, la madre de Rogelio, que, que está preocupada por esta relación de los jóvenes, decide llevarse a Rogelio de casa, se van a Galicia, esclavitud es eh, dejada detrás y eh, decide, decide suicidarse, ¿no? eh, cosa a la, que, a la que no asistimos en, en la novela. Pero termina la novela con una reflexión del narrador diciendo que esto es, eh, no es, como diría otro de los personajes que se define como muy pedante, algo propio de la raza gallega, sino que es algo que sucede en cualquier, en cualquier provincia y en, en cualquier ciudad española. ¿no? Nos trata de redistribuir estas connotaciones raciales de morriña a cuestiones de género. ¿no? Que el suicidio se produce por el, el, la marginación eh, que viene de la, de la clase social inferior y del, y del género femenino. Ahora, en mis conclusiones, en, en mi lectura de esta novela, como lo pongo en contexto de este enfrentamiento con el regionalismo gallego del, del momento, eh, lo leo como una, un intento eh, muy confuso, muy problemático, muy contradictorio de tratar de poner este mito rosariano eh, en su lugar, ¿no? confinándolo a estos límites del, del folclorismo, a los que quería reducir la, la poesía de, de Rosalía de Castro, eh, sin esa peligrosa voz subjetiva, ¿no? de ahí que no se le dé ningún tipo de voz a la, a la protagonista. Entonces, esta desconfianza ¿no? hacia el mito rosariano como, eh, como parte de esta causa regionalista que además está adquiriendo connotaciones más problemáticas en un contexto colonial, en el contexto de las rebeliones coloniales en, en Cuba. Eh, pero al mismo tiempo esto entra en una abierta contradicción con la agenda feminista de, de Pardo Bazán, porque por un lado con una lectura ecofeminista, que sería demasiado largo eh, hablar en el, en el espacio de, de esta presentación, eh, Pardo Bazán está denunciando esta, esta instrumentalización, esta objetificación de, de la mujer, asociándola con la tierra, asociándola con el, con el paisaje, en un intento de remasculinización ¿no? de esta causa nacionalista gallega. Denuncia esto, pero por otra parte está también resituando esto dentro de una objetificación de los confines de la, de la no subjetividad en defensa de su agenda nacionalista. Eh, entonces, es una, fue una lectura tortuosa, también por mi parte, ¿no? para, para tratar de mostrar estas contradicciones finales en las que acaba cayendo la siempre, siempre difícil, siempre espinosa Emilia Pardo Bazán. Y lo dejo aquí, creo que he llegado a mis cinco minutos. Muchas gracias. Muy bien, gracias, Carmen. Un gusto volver a verte. Igualmente, eh, María. A continuación, eh, Yolanda Ogando, de eh, la Universidad de Extremadura, eh, va a hablar de su contribución a este número especial que presentamos hoy, eh, un, un artículo que lleva por título eh, Emigration en Anton Vilar Pontes Theater, Foundations and Projections. Yolanda. Muchas gracias, María. Eh, hola, muy buenas noches aquí. Buenas noches, buenas tardes, buen día a todos y e todas. Muchas gracias eh, por asistir a esta presentación, eh, por el interés en este número tan interesante que me le va a agradecer especialmente a los editores, a Gustavo, Catherine y e María, por tener organizado en 2017 aquel congreso que también a mí me elevó a reflexionar un, un poco más eh, específicamente sobre el teatro de Antón Villarponte como representación cultural de la emigración galega, eh, por meter convidado posteriormente, eh, acompañado de manera realmente eh, exhaustiva, en la gestación y e publicación del texto definitivo. Eh, o me interese 
neste tema ten que ver xa con meu interese previo nas imaxes sobre a emigración que aparecían no teatro galego escrito tende máis ou menos o que se considera o inicio da historia galega da historia do teatro galego no último cuarto do século XIX até 1936 nese espazo Villar Ponte era realmente ou é realmente unha figura moi interesante no sistema literario e cultural, non só polas súas creacións literarias, nomeadamente teatrais, senón tamén pola súa actividade intelectual que o fixo participar, idear e pôr en práctica moitas iniciativas, moitas empresas para dar lugar ao asentamento da literatura nacional galega e, en grande medida, a moitas das ideas podíamos dicir que algúnas estereotípicas, sobre diversos aspectos que se definían, se debatían, desculpade, e se definiron no primeiro terzo do século XX. Interesaba en un momento, ou interesa en un momento Villar Ponte nese sentido, porque me lembra moito a un autor portugués sobre o que tamén traballei, Almeida Garret, que como a él foi dos cernes na cristalización do sistema literario moderno portugués. Moitas veces non tanto pola capacidade de trasladar as súas obras ao canon literario, que tamén se non é sobre todo por reflexionar sobre as necesidades que tiña o sistema literario e cultural e de reflexionar sobre ese propio sistema. Villar Ponte precisamente era o que apuntaba na década de 20 que houbera dous temas centrais no teatro galego dese período que o analizaba, que eran o caciquismo e a inmigración. Na verdade, esta afirmación é un pouco exagerada, non todos os textos, moitos deles moi desconhecidos, pero que nas últimas décadas teñen aparecido, teñen sido objeto de estudo, non todos falan sobre caciquismo e emigración. Pero sí é verdade que a emigración aparece nunha grande cantidade de textos teatrais dese período e concretamente caciquismo e emigración son dous polos fundamentais na súa creación dramática. Desa maneira, tentaba chegarme a obra dramática de Villar Ponte para analizar de novo a súa perspectiva sobre a emigración. E é verdade que até agora tiñamos e temos moi bos e extensos estudos sobre o pensamento Villar Pontino, tanto nos seus ensaios como na súa obra literaria. E neses estudos fálase sobre emigración, sobre teatro, e, de feito, chegarase a unha conclusión que é irrebatible. Dúas das súas obras máis relevantes, A patria do labrego de 1905 e Mais almas mortas de 1922, amosaban visións, ou amosan visións, diametralmente opostas sobre a emigración, sendo que na primeira a perspectiva do autor era moi positiva, na segunda, casi radicalmente negativa. Porén, non había un estudo específico sobre a correspondencia destas visións co resto dos seus escritos e ensaios que desen conta de por que nese mesmo período, entre a década de dos anos, que non chegaban a un inicio, do século XX até 1930, houbera ese cambio e, ao mesmo tempo, acompañaban matizacións ou pequenas contradicións semellantes as que se producían entre eses dous textos. Foi por iso ou foi esa razón que me levou a ter este como objetivo principal co que enfrontar o artigo. Pero tamén se me interesaba ver ou seguir as recomendacións de Jupp Lersen para tentar ver como nesa configuración do imaginario popular galego sobre migración tamén participaban os textos villarpontinos e ver até que punto reforzaban, negaban ou ignoraban algúns das ideas máis evidentes ou máis vixentes nesa época. E ao mesmo tempo tamén me interesaba ver como a hibridación, no sentido de creación de imaxes que comezan a mesturar perspectivas do aquén e do alén do retorno, neste caso do aquén e alén mar, de Galicia para o continente americano, aparecían nos seus textos. Deste xeito, a análise das pezas, en relación cos seus textos de carácter xornalístico e ensaístico, permitiu ver que esa viraxe case radical 
que, da que falaba antes, eh, en realidad agochaba una perspectiva mucho más compleja, poliédrica, que longe de desaparecer se mantivo eh, de manera mucho más clara en los escritos que eh, refería. Eh, cuidemos por lo tanto, comprobar que frente a las consideraciones más aparentemente, como decía, contradictorias, dos textos teatrais, los seus ensayos demostraban una negociación, eh, una perspectiva mucho más variada, que le va a afirmar, por ejemplo, pocos años después de la publicación de Patria de la Berego, que la migración era uno de los grandes males de Galicia, después de ter defendido que era una de las grandes soluciones perante otros problemas como el caciquismo. Y e ver cómo también las décadas posteriores eh, señalaba la migración como una de las grandes eh, causas dos, de males como eh, a sumisión o conformismo, a existencia de mujeres abandonadas, mesmo a transmisión de doenças y e hasta a depauperación de la raza galega. Llega en un momento a hablar de depauperación, tanto por ejemplo en algunos textos jornalísticos como en, en almas mortas. Pero al mismo tiempo aparecen otros escritos en los que eh, reconoce la gran contribución que los emigrantes hicieran, que hacían por el resto de Galicia, y cómo algunas de las ideas más progresistas e innovadoras procedían precisamente de la creación de eh, los galegos al Enma. Igualmente, este análisis permitió unos por en contexto a visión o a imágenes que sobre los emigrantes retornados. Eh, existían en ¿no? el teatro galego de esa época. Y es que es muy interesante ver cómo en ese proceso de hibridación, en los textos dramáticos sobre la inmigración, eh, a figura central muy tomáis que a dos eh, estereotipos, dos emigrantes galegos xerados en las sociedades de llegada eh, o retornados, xeraban a su vez un habano enorme, eh, contradictorio, que procedente tanto de las imágenes eh, americanas como de las imágenes galegas a propósito de los emigrantes galegos. Así pues, eh, este análisis en conclusión permitió unos ver y eh, demostrar la gran complejidad eh, que estaba por detrás del pensamiento villar continuo, eh, que de feito puede ser analizada eh, a través de los personajes que aparecen fundamentalmente en Almas Mortas, en no el no texto de 1922, y e ver que, por lo tanto, eh, os seus textos reforzaban, por un lado, algunas de las imágenes típicas, pero también las complementaban y e atanegaban algunos de esos estereotipos más influentes de inmigración galega. Eh, entendemos por qué, de feito, en eh, la década de 20 se pudo afirmar que el más importante teatro, eh, disculpa, de tratado sobre inmigración galega que fuera publicado hasta ese momento era Almas Mortas. No un ensayo, no un estudio sociológico, ni histórico, sino una peza teatral que eh, traslucía, en algunos casos destilaba muchas de esas ideas. E esas ideas, mesmo no siendo un teatro representado, porque en altura no estoy representado y de feito prácticamente no han sido representados, en pequeñas ocasiones de grupos amadores, pero en general no han sido representados, influyó de una manera fundamental en no el imaginario popular galego, a tal punto que eh, ainda hoy los estudios sobre migración, desde perspectivas históricas, sociológicas, etc., continúan a tener que matizar y e rebater algunos de esos estereotipos. Eh, de esa manera, lo que vimos es que si no era vero, no era verdad, cuando menos estaba suficientemente dentro vato para que se constituyesen como un referente central en la literatura, en la cultura eh, galega, eh, no me, centra, fundamentalmente centrada en la inmigración. Y ahí todo. Muchas gracias. Gracias, eh, Yolanda. Eh, a continuación, pues compartir a Gustavo San Román alguna reflexión sobre a su artigo. Eh, que le va por título Cosmorriña en Ángel Ramas, Tierra sin Mapa. Ok, hello again. Um, I, I hope you're, you're, you're ok, you're bearing uh, the, the experience of this um, uh, Zoom meeting well. This is the middle of the, of the uh, special issue, and I shall talk therefore about Angel Rama. Now, my article is the only one not on an author born in Galicia, and this is precisely my um, my aim here 
to explore the reverberations of Galicia beyond its borders and beyond its actual emigrants. The, the question I asked myself was, uh, how much does Galicia endure when the Galician who has left has died away from home? And does anyone pick up their baton even when the migrant has left no great literary or intellectual legacy? The answer I provide is that the legacy can endure through filial links. And I chose a work by an author and critic who is one of the great figures of Latin American studies. Uh, indeed, one of the founders of the discipline, uh, modern Latin American studies, Angel Rama, a kind of uh, Latin American Michel Foucault, his precise contemporary. Uh, whose views about understanding the literature of his subcontinent established a tradition of socially conscious, conscious criticism and pioneered ideas about transculturalism that continue to this day. But here, what I do is I study this author from a little known, rather secret, and complementary side, a dimension that might surprise those acquainted mainly with his rational and socially conscious body of work. Um, I focus on more personal material, um, diaries, correspondence, and especially an early text that occupies a marginal um, world between memoir and fiction. The text came out in 1959 uh, and is called Tierra Sin Mapa, literally a mapless or uncharted territory. A title that clashes with the goals of Rama's received work, um, such as his posthumous and influential The Lettered City, uh, Ciudad Letrada, which investigates the order in the two senses of mandate and organization imposed in the new world by an elite that began with the Spanish conquest and as Rama sees it, continued uh, into modern times, a very influential text in Latin American studies. Now, in Tierra Simapa, what Rama does is recreates the tales of rural Galician life, um, Galicia profonde, that he heard from his immigrant mother in Montevideo. And in doing so, he also reminisces on his ancestral roots. As we delve into this semi-fictional work, it becomes clear this connection with Galicia has informed his own outlook about the forces that have shaped modern Latin America. So Rama's process involves what I term, following Marianne Hirsch's notion of post-memory, what I term posmorinia, as his nostalgia for Galicia expresses the nostalgia that he inherited from his mother. I also posit that this is a model that can apply to other authors of Rama's generation, especially in the River Plate, where so many Gallegos settled at the turn of the 20th century. Finally, 
we can see Rama's case as a version of Galicia not letting go, which I referred to in my introduction earlier, through the genes left by its emigrants in other places. And it seems to me that is some measure of the power of Galician identity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gustavo. It is my pleasure now to pass over to David Miranda Barreiro from Bangor University, who is going to give his paper entitled Little Spain or Little Galicia, Cinematic Representations of Galician Migration to New York and New Jersey. Thank you, David. Thank you, Catherine. Um, pues en primer lugar, gustaría me agradecer, por supuesto, a Catherine, a María y a Gustavo por contar conmigo tanto para el Congreso originario como para... Eh, o, o Special Issue, y eh, 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 por su trabajo excelente de edición. Además, también es una honra estar en tan buena compañía y compartir publicación con este grupo de excelentes investigadoras. En lo que se refiere a mi contribución o artigo es parte de un proyecto de investigación, lo que llevo ya trabajando varios años, es que estudia a relaciones culturales entre Galicia y los Estados Unidos, particularmente con la ciudad de Nueva York, y e el vecino estado de New Jersey. El proyecto abrange diferentes aspectos relacionados con la inmigración, o exilio y e también la presencia de Nueva York en la literatura y e el cinema galego. En no el artículo eh, publicado en este especial issue confluyen dos de estos aspectos, ya que analiza tres películas más o menos recientes, salidas ya en este siglo XXI, en las que, na que los protagonistas son personas migrantes procedentes de Galicia, establecidas en Nueva York, y e diferentes puntos de Nueva Jersey. Dos de las películas son documentales, Little Spain, de 2014, dirigida por Artur Valder, e Os 15.000 de Newark, de 2007, de Ancho Fernández. E hay también un filme de ficción, Little Galicia, de 2015, de Albert Ponte. El título de Martigo refiere precisamente a ese contraste entre Little Spain y e Little Galicia, que aparece en no el nombre de dos de las películas. A mi análisis tengo dos puntos principales que están relacionados. Por una banda, una visión de identidad y de la cultura en sí misma como un acto performativo, y por otra, un cuestionamiento de la autenticidad de esa identidad que se fan las propias migrantes, como podemos ver en las películas. Nos documentáis esa performance o interpretación de identidad y además doble puesto que las personas entrevistadas actúan también dentro de los parámetros establecidos por el propio documental. En el caso de Little Spain, o marco es la emigración española a Nueva York y e la existencia de una comunidad española en la Rúa 14. Por en su actuación, los migrantes también se salen de ese marco en algunos momentos, de cierto que cuestionan a su validez. Cuando un dos entrevistados se refiere a comunidad española, y por ejemplo que sí, que había muchos españoles, de Coruña, de Sada, de Orense, de toda Galicia. Esto es un feito que además coincide con los datos ofrecidos en algunos estudios que indican que la mayoría de la inmigración procedente de España a esta zona de los Estados Unidos era de Galicia. Por otra banda, no documentar los 15.000 de Nueva a medida de parte de los entrevistados, que son personas migrantes eh, varias generaciones de descendientes, hablan casi todas en galego, y contan a sus actividades en los centros galegos. Muchas veces refírense a su lugar de origen como España, ainda que están hablando de Galicia. El aspecto performativo de identidad es particularmente visible en los 15.000 de Newark, donde los, los migrantes, las personas migrantes, hablan de cómo celebran las fiestas de su vida en la diáspora, de un sitio sincronizado en las mismas datas, más fuera de Galicia. E Refírense también a la comida que preparan y e a aprendizaje de la música y e baile galego en los centros. En Little Galicia, Little Galicia a película de ficción, tenemos también varios ejemplos de esta performatividad. El argumento del filme está de feito baseado en una confusión de identidades que son actuadas por el protagonista, que es un galego que visita a una familia emigrada de Galicia en New Jersey. Especialmente en los 15.000 de Newark, las migrantes falan de la semejanza de sus prácticas con las que se falan en Galicia. Y e hay un caso que me gusta especialmente, que es de un hijo de migrantes, se ha nacido en los Estados Unidos, 
que di que a primeira empanada de xurelos que probou en Galicia sabía exactamente igual que a que facía a súa aboa migrante en Nova Jersey. Mas a pesar disto, e de falar, por certo, nun algo perfecto, esta persoa cuestionese a autenticidade da súa identidade galega. E di que ainda que é da lá, ou síntese da lá, de Galicia, non é da lá como os que viviron en Galicia toda a vida. En Little Galicia, a película de ficción, hai tamén unha escena na que un dos emigrantes di de si mesmo que é un farsante, así literalmente. O que fai o meu artigo, entón, é examinar esta tensión entre unha identidade auténtica, entre comiñas, e a posibilidade de concibir a identidade non como un punto fixo no territorio galego, senón como un posicionamento, entendido como a expresión dunha identidade igualmente auténtica que se manifesta no acto performativo que fai a persoa migrante en calquera lugar do mundo, neste caso, nos Estados Unidos. Ata aquí cheguei eu. Moitas grazas. Gracias, David. Uh, I'll pass over now to our final speaker and final contributor to the issue. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Danny Barreto from Colgate University. And his article was entitled Returning to Virality, Querying Rural Spaces in Galician Literature. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and after a, a long day of seven hours of Zoom between teaching and meetings, uh, it's really nice to see so many familiar faces or at least your names on black boxes. Um, I'd also like to start by thanking our editors, Gustavo, Maria and Catherine um, for allowing me to be part of this project and for really creating um, just really a, a warm and welcoming space to have these conversations, to reflect on these issues in, beginning in St. Andrews in 2017 and continuing through now. Um, and I hope that um, people who pick up this issue kind of feel the spirit of sort of collaboration and, and friendship that, that you three brought to this project from its start. Um, my uh, paper takes a slightly different approach to mobility than I think most of the other articles in this issue. Um, rather than thinking about mobility as migration, um, I instead approached mobility as movement. Right, both in the physical sense of moving in and out or back and forth um, between spaces, um, but also as movement in the sense of social movement, as um, right, thinking of Galicia as moving us uh, towards someplace different, right, or something else. Um, and so, in, in in this article, returning to rurality, I discuss the ways that there's currently a physical and ethical political return taking place to Galicia's rural spaces, um, right? And this movement asks us to reconsider rural spaces, um, which we tend to talk about as either, right, being empty or void of things, right? Or in the case of Galicia, typically we think of, right, a lot of times we're talking about the abandono, the rural, um, as, and so, right, it becomes a sort of baleiro. Um, and what I think right, these, these movements are doing are asking us to think of these spaces as sites that are capable of uh, generating and sustaining dynamic, queer, anti-heteropatriarchal, anti-capitalist uh, modes of being, right, and Galician modes of being. Um, and so uh, for me, in, in approaching this topic and thinking about migration um, as also someone who's not, not from there uh, and thinking about directionality uh, and the way ideas flow, it was important for me to start this project by thinking not about what queer studies can bring to Galicia, but rather what Galicia contributes to uh, queer studies. Right? And so um, looking at what had been going on back when I wrote this in 2017 and what is still continues to be going, right, the, the movement that's still emerging and developing has been this um, really vibrant uh, movement of, of queer activism and cultural production, literary production mostly, right, that writes queerness into rural spaces. Um, and there's an emergent LGBT discourse that frames questions of, of queerness, not as necessarily about identity politics, but sees sexo-affective difference as questions intrinsically linked to biodiversity and cultural autonomy. Um, and so to give an example of that, right, the, the perhaps the best known is the Festival Agroqueer da Ulloa 
which takes place in Monterroso and Lugo, um, which brings together artisans, farmers, musicians, dancers, community members um, for a pride celebration. Right. And but I and these kinds of projects, even though they're they're relatively marginal and small, they actually offer profound challenges to the ways in which we typically think about uh, queerness, non-normative sexualities and genders, um, how we think about rurality and the relationship between queerness and rurality. Um, and so this sort of I always say leads me to write the two kind of main things that I look at in my article. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe deal with them in the opposite order. Um, but one is, right, if you start there, um, it seems that one of the major contributions to queer studies that Galicia has to make pertains to these conversations um, that are taking place around metronormativity, um, right? And that is a concept that comes from Jack Halberstam and was developed by other queer theorists. Um, but basically, right, questioning the assumption that LGBTQ life and politics is inherently an urban experience, um, right? The, the, the narrative um, that coming out is also a move from, uh, right, not just the closet to public space, but a move from rurality to an urban center. Um, and so, um, yeah, I guess given the sort of surprise, one doesn't expect to find a queer Galicia, uh, one wouldn't expect to find a queer rural thriving culture anywhere, which makes it extra surprising, right, to find a literature um, such as that which I, I talk about in this piece, right, um, books by and, and works by Andrea Barreira Freje, Eva Mejuto, Carlos Lixo, Maria Remondes, Mario Regueira, um, right, or even the film Elisa y Marcela, um, uh, which is a whole different thing, but right, but but that um, sort of tries to rewrite stories of queerness into rural spaces. Um, the other kind of question that I had to, to grapple with was how is it in the Galician context, at least that we, we came to associate rurality with homophobia or transphobia, or how did rurality become so linked to heteropatriarchal norms? And I, for in that section, I, I look back at the Resurdimento as a moment of sort of nascent modern Galician nationalism, um, where we often see tropes developing um, as some of the ones that have been been discussed already by by Carmen and, and Gustavo, right? Of the rural as sort of um, uh, pastoral or bucolic. Um, which also tends to frame it in very heteronormative terms. Um, and we could talk more about that, right? But I, and then I, on the other hand, there are these more sort of Gothic approaches to, to the rural that you see in um, writings of the Resurdimento by people like Ildefonso Lopez Saavedra, Hipólita Mourinho de Landrove, Heraclio Pérez Placer, um, that are these really lurid tales of domestic violence, heteropatriarchal and gender violence. Um, that are perpetrated in rural spaces, that are written onto rural spaces in different ways, um, and in which the space itself is complicit. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so these two things together, I think just sort of are an opportunity to reflect on uh, how what is happening now in these small ways or in perhaps seemingly unrelated texts and events taking place across Galicia, um, there's actually a really, um, interesting sort of rewriting of Galician narratives, uh, the modern Galician narratives and nationalist myths that we've sort of inherited um, to imagine a sort of Galician nationalism that is already queer, rural, sustainable, et cetera. Um, and with that, I will wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dani. And I'll pass over now to Gustavo and Ignacio to take questions. So, uh, well, apparently there are not many questions in the chat, but uh, I'm sure Gustavo will um, well, uh, surely has something uh, has something to to say, uh, so maybe as a way of, of of even as a farewell comment uh, on yep. after after each contributor has has. Um, well, has explained to us the content of his or her article. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Thank you, Ignacio. Thank you, everybody. Um, I just, uh, even though I read these things, I, 
I certainly was very excited to hear the versions of everybody. Um, and we were extremely, I don't know, is it because we're in Britain? We are a bunch of Galegos or Galeguistas and we carried out our goal to the exact um, hour. It's just now uh, one minute past the hour and our aim was to introduce the issue in one hour and then to allow any questions, um, a few minutes of questions if people did want to ask them. <laughs> um, but we certainly don't force you. Um, I see that Maria Palacios is saying congratulations. Thank you, thank you very much, Maria. Um, um, <laughs> thank you, she was also at the, at the meeting in St. Andrews. So, um, Thank you also, Maria Seishoka, uh, uh, Richard, for, for thanking us. Um, I hope you can read the, the issue. I hope this issue is, of course, one of several that have been reviewed others by, by uh, Maria and um, Catherine in their introduction. And what we hope is just to bring our little grano de arena to this um, so that it can carry on being um, continuing with the Galician uh, studies in the UK, in the Anglo-speaking world, um, to continue a tradition that, uh, as Ignacio pointed out, has been um, in this country, certainly in Britain and in the United States for, for quite a while. Um, uh, in Ireland too, David Mackenzie took Galician studies to, to Cork, there's a center there. There are centers here in Birmingham, in, um, in Oxford, uh, and there's been Galicians, even Galicians avant la lettre, like um, Catherine Davis, who, who, uh, whose idea it was this, and who was our editor, who started uh, studying Galician here, even before the, the movement of Galician studies. So um, I think, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, there you are. Uh, Catherine says there could be more uh, issues um, uh, in Galician studies. I hope they are. Well, I think if we are all happy, uh, I don't know how much, uh, how long one can take um, uh, Zoom. There are more comments coming in. Thank you very much, Olga. Um, yes, uh, Maria again. So I think uh, this, of course, will be recorded, I believe, Joaquin. So uh, it is recorded. You can come oh, back. Oh, there's a to question. It. There's a question there on the chat. Yeah. Oh, there is a question. Sorry. Yeah. A question to, to Danny. All of that. Okay. Who's asking? Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, I question to Danny. I lost the question. Did you also cover in your paper in which ways queer studies can or does actually contribute to, to current debates in religion studies, Danny? Um, thank you for the question, Olga. Um, I think the, there, there isn't a, a broader discussion in ways that you might be asking about the, the applicability or the, the utility or, or practicality of doing uh, queer studies in Galicia. Um, it, it tended more, um, to focus particularly on um, just the, the, the debates that are happening largely amongst um, North American and British uh, queer study scholars in rural spaces about, uh, about um, reimagining and recentering queerness in um, outside of cities and, and, and as such outside of neoliberal kind of capitalist mega uh, metropolis, metropolises. Um, and yeah, and I think within those debates, Galicia actually has a really important role to play in providing a model of, of alternative ways of imagining queerness, right? That, that remain unknown because of hegemonic languages and the ways in which Galician is sort of rendered invisible. Um, but yeah, I hope that, hope that answered your question. Hello, thank you. Uh, we have another question that I invite Catherine and Maria to answer. How has migration affected modern day Galicia? Well, I think we should organize another conference to discuss this question. Just a conference for this would do. But well, obviously migration has affected modern day Galicia to the point that there is a new Galician diaspora nowadays and it's we are like like in a historical 
and I don't know why we're not able to escape that loop. Uh, I was discussing, I was talking to, to a colleague the other day about how uh, countries that have historically um, sent millions and millions of people abroad, like Ireland or Scotland, have been able to finish with that, uh, I mean, to, to close that circle. Now Ireland and Scotland are recipients, so, or, or are, are at this very moment in time, are welcoming people from other parts of the world. They are not exporting human capital anymore, but Galicia is not able to change or to break this historical loop. So uh, it, it would be an interesting uh, debate. It would be interesting from a political point of view to to think why Galicia is still exporting human capital even nowadays. Um, uh, but I think this, this special issue is also opening new avenues of research that are necessary uh, nowadays, related not only to the new Galician diaspora, which is a thing, it's a thing that we, we all know about because we all know about someone who has emigrated, then we have this TV programs like Galibos Polo Mundo, Spaniards Polo Mundo, blah, 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 that talk about people emigrating and having amazing lives. Uh, but there is, there is a need, in my, in my view, to offer counter discourses to all these optimistic views on, on migration. Um, I, I'm not sure, Catherine, if you have anything else to add. I've been thinking a lot about immobilidad eh, recently for obvious reasons and I think it would be interesting also to think about um, immobility um, and certainly in terms of in relation to the pandemic obviously at the moment but how that has also um, how that's something that I think we could theorize more in terms of Galicia as well in terms of not moving as well as moving um, and certainly yes I think that's obviously for obvious reasons something I'm thinking about but then the mobility of something like this uh, which has brought us all together from all, all parts of the world um, to discuss this so yeah that's that's something that I would I would I think could be a very interesting point of departure. Thank you. I wonder David Miranda whether you have something to say yourself about how migration affected modern day Galicia since you studied the Los Nuevos Galegos, Los Nuevos Galegos, no, the New Yorican uh, Nuevos Galegos. How do they see, how, how is that affecting the modern Galicia idea, do you think? Well, something I, I, I actually mentioned in my, in my article, or, 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 I, I wonder about this, um, whether identity or Galicianness actually has uh, an origin that we can pinpoint in Galicia particularly, or whether uh, there's no identifiable origin to that identity in the sense that there are several marks of identity of Galician identity that were actually developed in, by, by the migrants into diaspora, like for example, um, the national anthem or, or the flag. And there are many um, exchanges and encounters across uh, transnational and across cultures. So um, in relation to how it has affected modern day Galicia, the question I, I, I ask myself and I wonder about this is whether we can understand Galicia without migration nowadays. So, um, and I don't want to move away in any way from what Maria was saying about the, the material aspects and, and the sufferings and the difficulties that migration brings with it still nowadays. But in terms of the way identity is formed, um, I, I, I think that migration has a, a, a lot of weight um, in, in making what we understand now as, as Galician-ness or Galician culture. So, well, that's a, just a reflection there. To know whether the, yeah, and, uh, as Maria said, you know this, this is an ongoing uh, uh, yeah. process of thinking about how you know the, the effects of migration on Galicia and Galician ness. But you know that's my uh, thank you. Reflection. Thank you, uh, David. I think one thing we could add is that, um, and I have some experience of that studying my own culture, is that um, people who go abroad 
especially people from Galicia, as I said earlier, do not forget home, but also ponder on home in a more objective way. The distance that um, you, you gain also gives you um, uh, a certain power for clarity. If you're outside Galicia, you think of Galicia uh, in a different way, uh, in a way that will definitely help the notion of what Galicia is, that Galician nest that you were referring to, I think. Um, may I invite Catherine Davis to say something? She's mentioned Rosalia um, because Rosalia Castro, Catherine is, is, is a world authority on Rosalia. And I think Rosalia is certainly present in, in everything that we have uh, studied in the in the in this particular issue, uh, do you think Rosalia still has a lot to say to us? Even though, as you say, she never left um, uh, Spain, certainly Madrid um, and Alicante. You say is is Rosalia still there? Do Galicians abroad still are still marked by Rosalia in some way? Do you think, Catherine? If you're still there. Perhaps you're not there. Okay, maybe. <laughs> oh, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, you Sorry. are. You are. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't get the mic. Uh, yeah, it's difficult to think of um, Ros Rosalia de Castro without Galicia and Galicia without Rosalia de Castro. Um, I think it's time that people moved on, you know, and uh, like Danny's doing, to try and think of um, Galician studies outside of migration, other than migration. Um, I think what Catherine was saying about immobility, because Rosalia de Castro stayed in Galicia, that's what everything, all her work's about. Um, immobility is a really nice topic, actually. What What about those who didn't go anywhere and are not thinking so much about migration. Is it still a big issue? I mean, a lot of English people have migrated, but uh, they don't go on about it here, whereas they do in Ireland because of um, social injustice. I don't, I don't think in Scotland, um, well, obviously the, um, the uh, appropriation of the lands was, was very harsh, but I don't think Scotland's particularly hung up on its migration, whereas Ireland is. And it would be nice to know what Wales thinks. So, I mean, there are there are ways of, of looking at this, but I think, you know, it's time to, to move on because a lot of people migrate and in today's globalization, um, it, it, it's 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 quite different yeah so i think what danny's doing is interesting that he's, he's taking a different a different theme about something else uh, so that it's not always about uh, migration and immigration in in galicia thank you catherine yes yes i was thinking of course the scots have uh uh, emigrated generally as settlers, didn't they? Mm. Um, they didn't emigrate out of hunger or out of poverty to the same extent that, that um, as, as both Ireland and Galicia originally went. And currently the great um, emigration from Galicia is from um, young people who are uh, highly qualified, but who don't find um, uh, work uh, of the sort they would like back home, no? So things, as you said, change according to the, the circumstances in each uh, setting. Um, Gustavo, um, they're asking a question. I think it's um, yes, they are. various people. Where to, get an issue, where to get a copy of the issue? Um, from Liverpool University Press, or you can get it from the IMLR, uh, except that there's no one there at the moment. Um, so you know nobody can put it in the post for you yeah. and 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 it's online if that's if you wanted a hard copy but if you want a an online copy um i'm pretty sure i don't know if there's anyone from L lup here right now but i'm pretty sure you can get it online uh because it's um so what date did it come out 2000 and uh oh tw it's just now isn't it 2020 it's I think, one. yeah 20. yeah so I, I i you may not be able to access it right now but if you've got jstor or uh project muse then you can access the uh the issue okay 
Thank you very much. Right. Um, okay, there was one question from uh, Jeffrey Maguire about post Mourinho and post memory being visual. Um, of course, the work from uh, Marianne Hirsch was very much on, on photographs, wasn't it? Um, do you see other ones? I was, I, I, I don't think I know enough about to answer that question, Jeffrey. Sorry. Um, I was more interested in, in the literary side, which is what I do, uh, the literature. I don't know what anybody else has um, vehicles at post Mourinho, uh, other perhaps than music, of course. Music is very much, um, uh, Galician music seems to, to spread quite a bit around, around the world, certainly in, in Latin America. Okay, I uh, don't know if anybody else wants to add to that one. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, uh, old student of mine. Uh, thank you very much for, for that question. There was a question. question before that one, Gustavo. Sorry? There was a question before that one. What's How that? Has, uh, the use of social media shaped the research. Yeah, my experience, yes, and the use of Galician. Yeah, that's a very fair question. We are now in the generation of, of WhatsApp, aren't we? Uh, again, Maria might be able to answer that one. Yeah, I have actually been thinking about this for a while now, uh, because I actually think that all these centros de Galego, above all those in Latin America, are now disappearing because, well, it's a different time, it's a different era, different century. But I think social media has a lot to do with the disappearance of all these big, massive, huge uh, centros, the centros galegos, both on, in Latin America, maybe London, blah, 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 because obviously new migrants don't need them anymore, <laughs> because we don't, we, we don't need to be in a, in a physical place anymore to talk to our Galician peers. Social media is facilitating all this. So uh, I think we still have to, to think what's going to, to happen with, with this, but something as I don't know, as culturally important for Galicians abroad as centros galegos are, yeah, I think they are being badly affected by the use of social media in this, in this sense. Not sure if anyone else has anything else to say. Okay. Um... Is there one last question before we we close the session. I don't think I missed any of the questions um, so far. Um, okay, if that's uh, everybody happy, um, I would like to uh, close by thanking both the organizers uh, of this evening, um, uh, Cervantes Institute and the uh, Institute of Modern Language Research very much. Um, and uh, indeed the 50 odd people that came to listen to us. And I hope some of you are able to, to read the, the issue and uh, keep pondering about uh, why Galicia attracts us whether we are from there or otherwise. So thank you all very much. I think we're happy to, to, close, um, to close this gathering. Thank you. Um, and I leave someone more technical than me to start closing us off. Thank you very much, Ignacio. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, contributors. All Wait the best. Bye-bye, good night. <laughs> thank you. All right, bye-bye. <laughs>